Welcome to History at the OK Corral. Don't forget to subscribe, hit the like button, leave us a comment down below, and share this episode with a fellow history lover. And now, on to tonight's episode. Corpus Christi, Texas, late spring, 1846. As the burgeoning township bustles with citizens going about their daily commerce and conversation, a man sits alone in a hotel lobby, seemingly unbothered, reading a handwritten note with as much regard as if he were perusing a mildly interesting article from one of the city's local newspapers. The note, however, brings gravely serious news. The dreaded Comanche, the mighty lords of the southern plains who, despite the incessant conflict between Mexico and the newly arrived Anglo settlers, are the true rulers of Texas, have once again been on a trail of wanton death and destruction. Very few times in the history of the Old West had any contending force been able to offer up more than a tacit defense against the highly mobile, highly skilled, and legendarily aggressive horse-bound warriors. The man in the hotel lobby knowingly folds the note, places it in his jacket pocket, and moves out the door into the street, bearing the countenance of a man simply striking out on a morning stroll. However, the man's reputation belies his cordial, understated manner. His name is Captain John Coffey Hayes, better known as Captain Jack Hayes, and he is perhaps the most well-known Texas Ranger in the state. The note informs Hayes that a party of 600 Comanche warriors have spent the previous few days raiding settlements southwest of San Antonio. Now Hayes and the 40 rangers under his command in the town of Corpus Christi make their way to the Medina River, west of the city of San Antonio. From here, they make their way north, to an area known as Bandera Pass. Finding the trail of the Comanche raiding party with the indispensable assistance of their native guides, the rangers then make their way northwest, past the legendary landmark known as Enchanted Rock. It is concluded amongst the veteran rangers and native scouts alike that the Comanche are headed west for a small lake located at the base of what is known as Paint Rock, a favorite watering spot for raiding parties. Hayes and his men now agree that taking the most direct route to the watering hole is their only hope of catching the Comanche before they are able to disperse upon the vast open plains of northern Texas. Hayes drives the men until well past midnight, even then allowing only a short rest until daylight. At sunrise, the party again pulls their stiff and sleep-deprived bodies into their saddles for another full day's ride across the undulating, limestone-strewn terrain. Finally, in the early evening, they arrive at the pictograph-strewn rocks that give Paint Rock its all-too-apt moniker, and Hayes and his men come upon the large pond that serves as the noted watering hole. Seeing themselves to have arrived before the Comanche, the rangers and scouts hurriedly make their way to a small thicket of willow trees located on the northern end of the pond. The thicket, replete with a thick underbrush, will serve as the rangers' hiding spot as they wait to ambush the Comanche. As night casts its shadow over the whole of the landscape around them, Hayes posts sentries to keep watch and orders the rest of the men to sleep as well as they are able. In what must seem like a literal blink of the eye to most of the men, the first rays of sunlight are soon peeking over the eastern horizon. Soon, after the sun begins to rise in earnest, the silhouettes of several dozen Comanche warriors, herding their stolen horses, can be seen making their way towards the pond. The morning is typically muggy, causing a small fog to form around the pond itself. In whispered tones, Hayes instructs his men to wait for his command to fire their initial volley. Though he is a man of medium height and build, possessive of a high-toned voice, and known by all as particularly well-mannered, especially for a crowd as notoriously bellicose and ill-behaved as the Texas Rangers, Hayes knows his orders will be obeyed by his men. Though he cuts a unique figure on the rough and tumble edges of bleeding Texas, Jack Hayes has earned his respect, admiration, and loyalty from this lot of hard-scrabble men. The Comanche as well are well aware of Hayes and his rangers' efforts to stem their tide of raiding. 
It is well known throughout the whole of Texas that the scalp of any Texas Ranger is highly coveted by the Comanche, and that the scalp of Captain Jack Hayes is perhaps the most sought after in all of what the Spanish of centuries past had termed Comancheria. However vaunted his reputation though, Hayes and every man in the thicket, native scout and ranger alike, knows that they are now in a mortally dangerous situation, one in which the element of surprise and maintaining an offensive attack will spell the difference in their surviving the day or suffering a brutal demise at the hands of the Comanche. For an agonizing few minutes, the Comanche, riding in a spread out, loose formation, make their way towards the watering hole. Finally, when the Comanche are mere yards away, the morning air is cut by the shrill Tennessean accent of Jack Hayes, shouting, Fire! The rangers and scouts let loose their initial volley from their single-shot rifles, but several of the shots missed their mark in the morning fog. A few of the unsuspecting Comanche are knocked from their horses, most soon lying still in death. Their comrades, unable to rescue them in the fray, retreat to outside of rifle range and wait for the sun to rise fully to illuminate the battlefield. As the ground becomes more and more visible to the Comanche, they discern from the rangers' tracks that the Texas party is far smaller than their own. They see their odds as favorable and decide to proceed with a head-on assault on the willow thicket. Just as soon as the sun is visible in its totality, Hayes, the veteran rangers, and scouts see the Comanche chief don his headdress and exhort his men to bravery and ruthlessness and the coming charge. As the Comanche, still outside of rifle range, marshal their forces into a long, single line, Hayes instructs his men, at the mercy of their single-shot rifles and relatively new revolver pistols, to pick one warrior take careful aim, and shoot them down. Every shot must count, he reminds them, or they are sure to be overrun. Then, for an all too brief moment, the men in the thicket find themselves near mesmerized by the nearly medieval spectacle before them, one that has struck terror throughout the frontier for nearly two centuries. The Comanche are armed with stout, short bows, similar to those used centuries before by Genghis Khan and the Mongols on the vast steppes of the Central Asian plains. Comanche lances, used primarily for spearing running buffalo from behind, measure roughly 14 feet in length and are just as deadly in combat against humans. Comanche's shields are notoriously sturdy and often able to deflect bullets when held at the correct angle. Some of the warriors are also armed with rifles acquired from trading and raiding. Hayes and his men are not yet armed with the Walker Colt pistols that will spell a deciding difference in many fights yet to come. Instead, they possess that weapon's predecessor, the Patterson Colt revolver. Chambered in 44 caliber, the revolver possesses a rotating cylinder holding five shots. These cylinders must be detached to be reloaded, and thus the Rangers carry several preloaded cylinders. For a few brief moments, some of the Rangers hold the hundreds of advancing warriors in awe. Riding in front of the formation is the chief they had first seen on the horizon. The chief wears a fringed buckskin shirt, adorned with silver ornaments, along with a buffalo headdress complete with a tuft of buffalo hair at the front to hide his face. The warrior carries a large shield and spear and bears the countenance of a man keenly familiar with the perils of combat. At first sight, Many among the rangers feign a reticence to fire upon the advancing Comanche, remarking that they are, quote, too pretty to shoot. However, their hypnotic fascination is soon broken when the warriors break into a headlong charge, heading towards the northeast corner of the thicket. The rangers again hold their fire until the Comanche are within range as war whoops and the rumble of galloping horses fill the air. In their classic formation, the Comanche now advance in a cyclone, whirling towards the rangers in a circular motion, with each warrior loosing their arrow at the moment they are closest to the ranger position, before continuing their pattern to the back of the formation, only to reload and fire again on their next revolution. 
the charge continues forward, with hundreds of arrows pouring into the thicket. Then, as suddenly as the charge began, all other sound is momentarily drowned out amid the torrent of gunfire and smoke that fills the air. Dozens of warriors fall to the ground, their riderless horses charging onward toward the ranger line or following their cohorts back into the fray of the Comanche formation. The Comanche now deviate their path of attack southward, attempting to sweep around the backside of the thicket. This serves to distract the rangers as the wounded Comanche now make desperate, pitiable attempts to crawl their way to the cover of the cliffs of painted rock. The second attack is diverted as well, with another round of cacophonous gunfire from the thicket, and the Comanche, momentarily reeling, move back to the cover of the cliffs to regroup and tend to their wounded comrades. For several nerve-wracking minutes, the Texans and native scouts in the thicket can only reload and wait in a tense silence for another imminent Comanche attack. Suddenly, the Comanche war chief again appears on the horizon of the cliffs, followed by hundreds of charging warriors, seemingly more intent on dislodging and killing their quarry than ever before. Again, Hayes reminds the men to make their shots count, and again the Comanche charge the southern edge of the thicket, with Hayes and his men holding their fire until the Comanche are within mere yards of their position. This charge, too, is rebuffed, and the Comanche retreat to the northern end of the lake to again convene and decide on their next course of action. They decide that a lance charge is in order. They will close ranks with the Texans and scouts in the thicket and kill them at close range. Another charge is made, with hundreds of warriors streaming towards the ensconced ranger position. Again, they are driven back by their enemy's precise fire. Now, this gruesome pattern repeats throughout the afternoon, as the Comanche mount charge after charge on the thicket, their fury mounting in equal proportion to their losses. Finally, just before nightfall, the attacks abate, and the Comanche withdraw to outside rifle range, where they camp in plain sight of the scouts and rangers now effectively trapped inside the thicket. Hayes, for his part, posts centuries throughout the night as his men attempt to rest. Their proximity to the lake renders them able to resupply their drinking water and enables them to cut off the Comanche from doing so for themselves. The Comanche, instead, are forced to travel several miles to obtain water safely. Though they are camped outside of the ranger's rifle range, several attempts are made by warriors throughout the night to sneak onto the battlefield in order to retrieve the bodies of their slain comrades. Several of these warriors, too, are cut down in their attempts by fire from the ranger sentries. The intermittent gunfire carries on through the night, making sleep a scarce commodity for all. On the second day, as the sun rises, the Comanche attacks again continue, seemingly having lost none of their ferocity and determination from the previous day. For hour after hour, Wave after wave of Comanche warriors make attempts at overrunning the entrenched Texan position. They then divide their forces into four groups, with each group attacking the thicket from a different direction. Several times, these groups come close to overtaking the rangers and scouts and impaling them on the end of their 14-foot lances. For the entirety of the day, the attacks continue, until again the Comanche retreat out of rifle range and make camp. Hayes again, orders his men to get all the sleep that they can, and every combatant on the field settles in for yet another restless night. After another long night, another Comanche charge comes, this time barely illuminated by the light of dawn. As the third day of the battle commences, Hayes and his men are all too aware that their limited ammunition is becoming ever more limited with every Comanche charge. It is also suspected that the Comanche may have sent runners for reinforcements, painting an even more dire situation for the trapped contingent of rangers and scouts. For several hours, again, wave after wave of attacks are made, this time all of them accosting the north side of the thicket. With each successive charge, the Texians 
yet to incur any casualties of their own, managed to deplete the Comanche forces of more and more warriors and horses. Soon, the battlefield is a bloody morass of human and equine bodies alike, lying prostrate and still on blood-soaked ground. Finally, late in the morning, the Comanche war chief assembles his men into a line. Though the rangers and scouts cannot discern the words being spoken, the tone is one of stern admonition. It is quickly inferred that the Comanche are determined to make one final charge, even at the sure cost of many of their own lives. Within a fleeting few moments, the final charge is at hand, with the Comanche bearing down upon the thicket at full speed, bellowing their war cries with all their might. Again, the rangers and scouts hold their fire as the charge advances. This time, Hayes advances in front of the thicket, taking careful aim at the chief leading the charge. As arrows begin to fly in among the thicket, the ranger captain and chief see the ground between them rapidly closing. For a split second, the chief turns to issue a directive to his warriors. This, however, is the opening Hayes has waited for, as it momentarily exposes the chief's torso from behind his sizable shield. With the retort of Hayes's rifle, the chief falls to the ground, irretrievably caught in the throes of death. His warriors, ever loyal to their cohort and leader, stop to attempt to assist him, and are peppered with gunfire from the thicket. As they mill about the edges of the battlefield, making a series of ill-advised attempts at retrieving their leader's body, one of the rangers rides swiftly onto the battlefield, and, in a macabre scene, ropes the feet of the dead chief and drags his body back into the thicket to be rifled through by the victorious rangers and scouts. Though they are greatly disheartened and disgusted, the Comanche have no further desire to sacrifice their warriors and horses in an increasingly futile attempt to kill but a scant few trespassers in their territory. Soon, they disappear to the northwest. For several hours, Hayes orders the men to remain in their positions in order to ensure that the Comanche retreat was not another tactical feint. Once this is assured, the rangers and their scouts are free to go about the grisly business of securing war trophies in the form of loot, weaponry, and scalps. One ranger has incurred an arrow wound to his forearm in the final charge, and one horse has been killed. In turn, over 100 dead Comanche are counted, with many believing there to be more killed warriors carried off by their comrades. Though the war between Texas and the Comanche will continue on for decades, this will be the last time Captain Jack Hayes engages them on the battlefield in Texas. For his part, Hayes will go on to command the Rangers in the coming Mexican-American War, before making his way to California during the Gold Rush. But the countless tales of violence, vengeance, ruthlessness, and courage in the history of Texas are, for tonight, other stories for other times. Thank you for joining us on this episode of History at the OK Corral. Be sure to click the like button, share this episode with a friend, and become a subscriber. Also, if you'd like to support our work and gain early access to episodes as well as ad-free viewing, you can become a member of this channel by clicking on the join button or click the link in the description to become a member on Patreon. Thank you again for watching, and we'll see you next time on History at the OK Corral, home of history's greatest shootouts and showdowns.